it's pretty unusual. Uh, this guy is, uh, you know, somebody just keeps digging his hole deeper and deeper. You gonna raise your voice at me? Oh my God. You raise your voice to me, I raise my voice to you. you Those were images that frankly kept me up at night that I saw over and over. That's your bad finger. I didn't appreciate that. So you gonna threaten me like you did the other day? Run off multiple attorneys, Judge. Um, it does not make him a competent person. Number 15, Alan McCarty. Alan McCarty's life took a devastating turn when he found himself embroiled in a bitter and contentious child custody battle. The situation escalated to a point where he felt utterly frustrated and disheartened by a judge's ruling that went against him. Unable to cope with the overwhelming emotions, McCarty's anger began to spiral out of control, leading him down a dark and dangerous path. In a moment of desperation, McCarty resorted to making alarming and chilling threats, completely disregarding the potential consequences of his actions. That's so bad of anger. I didn't appreciate that. So you're going to threaten me like you did the other day? That being said, um, number one, I need to know whether or not you want to be here during the trial process. Ready to participate here? No, you time. threatened my life the other day. I am not under oath. Back room. Something! Oh, I'm not saying that. Being done unconstitutionally. These all took my kids unrightfully. You won't allow my witnesses here. I'm not resisting. I'm just not standing up. I'm not standing. I don't have to stand. You won't allow my paperwork. Y'all took all my court paperwork. We haven't started the trial yet. It doesn't matter. Adjudicate him guilty. Sentence him to 15 years in Florida State Prison. Has to count two when adjudicate him guilty. You want to take my kids from me and act like that? You win! Sentence of five years to run consecutive to count one. These threats not only posed a serious risk to the judge's personal safety, but also raised concerns about the well-being of the innocent children caught in the middle of this turmoil. Understandably, the judge, whose primary responsibility is to uphold justice and protect the interests of all parties involved, recognized the gravity of the situation and took immediate action. Faced with the alarming threats and the volatile behavior exhibited by McCarty, she made the difficult decision to take drastic measures to safeguard herself and the children. As McCarty set foot in the courtroom, his anger remained unabated, consuming him to the point where he could no longer control his outbursts. He unleashed a torrent of obscenities, demanding the return of his children without regard for the decorum and rules of the court. The judge, a pillar of composure in the face of chaos, attempted to restore order urging McCarty to maintain silence and respect the proceedings. However, blinded by his seething rage, he stubbornly persisted in disrupting the courtroom, his words dripping with venom and hostility. Inevitably, the legal system caught up with McCarty and he was held accountable for his menacing threats. After due process and a thorough examination of the evidence, he was found guilty, underscoring the seriousness of his actions. The judge, Recognizing the need to protect society and maintain the integrity of the justice system, handed down a significant sentence, 20 years behind bars. This substantial punishment was intended not only to serve as a deterrent to others, but also to provide some measure of justice for the victims and reaffirm society's abhorrence for such behavior. Yet the repercussions for McCarty did not end there. His unruly and disrespectful conduct within the courtroom had pushed the judge's patience and tolerance to its absolute limit. In an act of just retribution, she chose to impose an additional sentence of 10 days. This seemingly small extension held a powerful message, making it unequivocally clear that any form of disrespect or disruption in the court proceedings would not be tolerated or taken lightly. The judge's actions, though undoubtedly severe, were necessary to uphold the principles of justice, maintain order, and ensure the safety of all those involved. By imposing such significant penalties, she sought to restore the sense of justice and protect the vulnerable individuals affected by McCarty's actions. It served as a stark reminder that the courtroom is a place for reasoned arguments, respect for the law, and the pursuit of justice, and that any deviation from these principles will be met with firm consequences. No, do you want to be here or not? 
swear I am. I'm not under oath. Raise your hand, please. I'm the interest. Every right y'all I'm supposedly have violated. Number 14, Daryl Brooks. In a chilling incident that would forever haunt the community of Waukesha, Wisconsin, the name Daryl Brooks became synonymous with tragedy and devastation. With a complete disregard for human life, Brooks plunged his SUV into a vibrant Christmas parade, indiscriminately taking lives and shattering families. The prosecution left no room for doubt, presenting compelling evidence to argue that his actions were intentional, demonstrating that Brooks had maliciously orchestrated this horrifying act of violence. As the trial unfolded, he can see them. Anyone driving a vehicle would see what's ahead. Mr. Brooks. Come on, man, stop. When you, you stop are, it. You are stop even it. letting You're a public me ask servant, question, Your Honor. That Mr. Brooks would have seen all of these people. This is not under cover of night. That this was the one unlike any other. And also, probably one that will be very hard to forget. It's hard not to think about what I watched and not have this reaction. Allow Brooks to represent himself. Now, he may look back on that decision and say, that probably wasn't the best choice. For their band director, she is a hero to me, to get up on the stand, to talk about. And Brooks decided to fire his defense lawyers and represent himself. Those were images that frankly kept me up at night, that I saw over and over. I watched the body fly up onto the hood and her head snapped back. Sarah Waymire, Arparicio, to identify each one of her students. Brooks made the ill-fated decision to act as his own defense attorney, a choice that would ultimately prove disastrous. From the very beginning, it became evident that his behavior within the courtroom was deeply unsettling. Without restraint or remorse, he unleashed a torrent of interruptions and outbursts, revealing a side of himself that sent chills down the spines of those witnessing the proceedings. His detached demeanor during witness testimonies, marked by inexplicable laughter, painted a disturbing portrait of a man seemingly disconnected from the gravity of the situation. The courtroom, meant to be a solemn place for justice, instead became a twisted stage for Brooks's unsettling performance. With each passing day, Brooks's complete lack of respect for the judicial process became more apparent. He took every opportunity to mock and ridicule the district attorney, going so far as to deride him for a minor mispronunciation, further solidifying his reputation as an unrepentant defendant. In a chilling display of contempt, Brooks engaged in a chilling stare-down with the judge, a power play that aimed to undermine the authority of the court. However, despite Brooks's disruptive antics and his disdain for the proceedings, justice ultimately prevailed. The jury, swift in their decision-making, Talk about their formation. Talk about what she saw. Body remained on the hood as it passed the side of my vehicle to where I thought I could have just reached out and grabbed her. The SUV went over people like they were big old speed bumps. If you don't make a record, so then what? I can't it, make a ruling. It threw people off the loop. They weren't ready for it. They scared of it. That's what it is. Oh, man. Some of the highlights that and I should call them lowlights, not highlights, but some of the testimony and evidence that really, really impacted the court. I just want the court to understand it's, it's, it's very emotional. Understanding for Mr. Brooks, other than he's in the middle of a parade. What an interesting and bizarre few weeks we've had following the Darrell Brooks trial out of Waukesha, Wisconsin. Right, what was ahead of him? We saw that video footage, we heard the testimony. Found him guilty on all 76 charges laid against him. The weight of his heinous crimes was reflected in the sentence handed down by the judge, a sentence that aimed to ensure the protection of society from this callous individual for the remainder of his days. Brooks received the harshest of punishments, six life sentences and an additional 700 years in prison, a clear message that his actions would not be tolerated and that he would be removed from society, never to pose a threat again. Not only for just the whole situation of the trial, uh, the family's here to have to go through. This wasn't one isolated person that he could claim, I didn't know I struck someone. Do you know for sure if the driver of the vehicle you observed was in fact angry? I'm not gonna go through that. They were significant. It was horrific. The vehicle was beeping its horn. I imagine that the driver was angry and wanted to get through the crowd. Number 13, Jeremy Christian. Portland, Oregon witnessed the horrifying consequences 
of Jeremy Christian's deep-seated hatred. Fueled by a racial rant directed at two young women on a crowded train, he unleashed an onslaught of violence. In a matter of moments, lives were lost and families were forever scarred. During the trial, Christian's disturbing behavior became apparent. Disruptive and volatile, he consistently displayed contempt for the court and the victim's families. His outbursts knew no bounds. He hurled insults at the victim's mother, callously mocking her loss, and showed a complete disregard for the solemnity of the proceedings. Despite attempts by the judge to maintain order, Christian remained defiant. He made bizarre accusations, questioning the judge's integrity and even implying a physical relationship. His relentless disruptions, combined with his dismissive attitude towards his legal representation, prolonged the trial and tested the patience of all involved. As the trial wore on, it became evident that Christian's fate would be sealed. Found guilty of two counts of slaying and attempted slaying, he faced a punishment befitting his heinous crimes. The judge sentenced him to two consecutive life terms, along with over 25 additional years, ensuring that he would pay the price for his hate-fueled rampage. Number 12. Bass Webb In the realm of courtroom dramas where order and decorum are expected to prevail, there are occasional disruptions that shake the very foundation of justice. Bass Webb, a name that resonates with chaos and unpredictability, was one such defendant who left an indelible mark on the courtrooms where his fate was decided. Webb's tumultuous journey began when he was charged with two counts of attempted slaying in Lexington, Kentucky. The courtroom became the stage where his malevolence unfolded, as captured by a chilling security camera. In a shocking act, Webb tried to run over two employees at a jail he had recently served time in. The footage showcased the utter disregard for human life that seemed to consume him. As the trial commenced, it became evident that the judge had a personal connection to the two targeted employees. This revelation was enough for the judge to contemplate recusing herself from the case. However, Webb, with a malevolent glint in his eyes, decided to unleash chaos in the courtroom. He directed a vile and contemptuous spit at the judge, an act that shocked everyone present. Undeterred by the consequences of his actions, Webb seemed to revel in the turmoil he caused. Digging deeper into Webb's dark past uncovered an even more sinister truth. During his time behind bars, he had been charged with the slaying of not one, but two different girlfriends. The details surrounding these heinous acts were haunting, casting a foreboding shadow over the courtroom proceedings. Webb, unapologetic and remorseless, arrived in court with a chilling tattoo on his head, listing the names of people he wanted to slay. It was a stark reminder of the darkness that consumed him. Throughout the trial, Webb showed no remorse for his actions. He fired several of his lawyers, perhaps as an attempt to exert control over a situation that was quickly spiraling out of his grasp. His disruptive behavior became his modus operandi, from blowing kisses to the families of his victims to making unsettling hand gestures. The courtroom became a battleground of wills, with Webb's contempt for authority radiating from every fiber of his being. Despite the chaos he unleashed, the wheels of justice continued to turn. The trial extended far beyond its expected timeline, as Rhodes's unpredictable nature ensured that no resolution was easily reached. His disruptive behavior was met with stern admonishments from the judge, who urged him to choose a path that would serve his own interests rather than harm them further. As the trial unfolded, it became increasingly evident that Webb's presence within society was a grave danger. His actions, fueled by an unyielding rage and disregard for human life, had left an irreparable trail of destruction. The jury, presented with overwhelming evidence, found him guilty of his crimes. The judge, recognizing the severity of his actions, sentenced Webb to life in prison, ensuring that society would be spared from his malevolence. Number 11. Bryce Rhodes In the annals of courtroom dramas, few defendants evoke a sense of bewilderment and tragedy as much as Bryce Rhodes. His journey through the legal system, marred by disruptive behavior and a dark past, paints a picture of a troubled soul consumed by chaos and violence. Rhodes's descent into infamy began when he mistakenly shot and slayed an innocent man, tragically mistaking him for another individual. This fatal error set into motion a series of events that would culminate in an unthinkable tragedy. Two brothers, aged 16 and 14, were unfortunate witnesses to the crime. 
Fearing their potential testimony, Rhodes decided to silence them permanently. It was a decision that would haunt the courtroom for years to come. As the trial commenced, Rhodes's behavior became increasingly erratic. He seemed to revel in the chaos he created, blowing kisses to people in the courtroom, including the grief-stricken family members of his victims. The weight of his actions seemed lost on him as if he existed in a state of detached amusement. Such disruptive behavior defied the solemnity of the courtroom, adding an extra layer of tragedy to an already heart-wrenching tale. For the defense, um, the court having ruled that I am not able to testify. Murders of two teenage brothers, and what he tells them is a story that would shock most. Run off multiple attorneys, Judge. Um, it does not make him a competent person. Well, if we knew that, man, we'd already, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I wish I could help you with know, what it was, you know, I don't an accused triple murderer is in more hot water this time. Investigators say he threatened a corrections officer. Not long after, Rhodes stopped answering questions and asked for a lawyer. But um, That's all the, the witnesses that we have. Rhodes's audacity and contempt for authority were on full display as he engaged in a battle of wills with the judge presiding over his case. Unfazed by the consequences, he hurled accusations questioning the judge's integrity and even suggesting an intimate relationship or racism as motives behind her decisions. This outrageous behavior further muddied the waters of justice, ensuring that his trial extended far beyond its anticipated time frame. Despite Rhodes's disruptive antics, the trial pressed on, with the prosecution presenting a compelling case against him. The weight of the evidence was overwhelming, leaving little doubt as to his guilt. The jury, burdened with the responsibility of rendering a just verdict, found Rhodes guilty on all counts. The courtroom, a hushed space gripped by grief and despair, awaited the judge's sentencing. Recognizing the magnitude of Rhodes's crimes, the judge handed down a sentence befitting the gravity of the situation. Two consecutive life terms, accompanied by more than 25 years for his other convictions, ensured that Rhodes would spend the remainder of his days behind bars. It was a sentence that brought a modicum of closure to the grieving families, but it could never fully erase the pain and loss they endured. As the doors of the courtroom closed behind Rhodes, his disruptive journey through the legal system came to an end. The echoes of his disruptive behavior lingered, a stark reminder of the havoc he wreaked upon the lives of innocent individuals. His tale stood as a testament to the chilling capacity of human nature, a cautionary tale that transcended the boundaries of the courtroom and force society to confront the depths of darkness that lie within us all. Number 10. William Demopoulos In the somber atmosphere of Beria, Ohio's probation hearing, a young man named William Demopoulos became the embodiment of rebellion. Charged with criminal damaging, unauthorized use of a motor vehicle and obstructing justice, his presence in court was marked by a brewing storm of disobedience. Judge Chris Green sought to establish order requesting Demopoulos to surrender his phone to the probation officer. But the young defendant, driven by his unwavering determination, defiantly refused. His allegiance lay with his cell phone, and he was willing to sacrifice his freedom to protect it. Judge Green, resolute in upholding the rules, explained the consequences of Demopoulos' actions. As tension mounted, deputies closed in on the unyielding defendant. Yet Demopoulos saw only one path, one way out, and with that, chaos erupted. The officers swiftly subdued him, overpowering his resistance. The judge, dismayed by the scene unfolding before him, revoked Demopoulos's probation and added charges of resisting arrest. The weight of justice bore down on Demopoulos as he was sentenced to 40 days behind bars. Number 9. Milton Watts In the courtrooms of Beria Municipal Court, Milton Watts's journey took a precarious turn. The 21-year-old arrived, devoid of legal counsel, hoping to represent himself in a domestic violence case, a risky decision for someone with little knowledge of the intricate dance within the realm of law. You were supposed to be here last month. You did not appear. Why weren't you here? Yeah, I had work. Can I give you a piece of advice? What? You can either make life easy or you can make life hard. My mom didn't show up. Uh, somebody died in the family. There was no reason for me to be here. That's stupid. No, stop. Judge Chris Green, keen on ensuring a fair trial, extended a lifeline to Watts, questioning if he understood the concept of a bond. 
However, what followed was a spiral into the depths of contempt. Watts unwittingly dug himself deeper into the abyss, inadvertently inviting additional consequences. With every passing moment, Watts's impudence grew, defying the authority before him. He carelessly discarded the fragments of a future that he himself shattered. Despite the judge's attempts at mercy, Watts's self-destruction persisted. Judge Green, met with an insolence that stretched the limits of tolerance, pronounced a sentence that mirrored the weight of Watts' contempt. After a tumultuous journey, Watts found himself sentenced to a grueling 90 days in the very confines he had dared to challenge. You're a lawyer? Nope. You want to talk to me about me at bond with me? What do you want to tell me? Get 30 days in the county jail for contempt. Cuff him if you get the cuffs. It's not an engraved invitation, son. It's a court order. All right. I'm resetting it then for you. Number eight, Joshua Martinez. Las Vegas, Nevada became the stage for a unique spectacle as Joshua Martinez donned the role of his own legal counsel. Charged with driving with a suspended license, he took it upon himself to question the jurisdiction of the court and probe the intricate details of the case. Intrigued by his audacity, the judge patiently navigated Martinez's attempts to outmaneuver the system. But as his cleverness pushed the boundaries, the judge's patience waned. The courtroom echoed with the stern declaration that the judge, and only the judge, held authority over the proceedings. Martinez, undeterred, persisted in his defiance. Direct contempt manifested in his actions, and he was promptly removed from the courtroom. Twenty minutes later, he re-entered, seemingly willing to atone for his missteps. However, Martinez remained steadfast, unyielding in his convictions. Ultimately, Martinez received a 15-day sentence for contempt of court, and his original charge of driving without a license was dismissed. A whirlwind of legal acrobatics had left its mark, and Joshua Martinez stood as a testament to the limits of defiance within the judicial realm. Is that a criminal offense or civil? Criminal? Okay. Martinez, I, would like to I am in charge of this courtroom court. and you're going to stop no, it. We are in charge of the court. Is there a, a sworn statement against me or your party? Marshal, would you show Mr. Martinez the inside of our holding tank, please? You probably received a citation on April 12th. That would be the criminal complaint filed against you. You're not going to tell me who's in charge of my courtroom, Mr. Martinez. Go ahead and go with the marshal. Number 7. Dale Roy Greenman As the bond hearing commenced in the Orlando courtroom, tensions rose to a boiling point when Dale Roy Greenman found himself facing theft charges. The accusations were seemingly trivial – a pack of cigarettes, a lighter, and a Gatorade. But Greenman's response was anything but inconspicuous. Upon hearing that his misdemeanor charge could potentially escalate to a felony due to his prior involvement in tampering with evidence, Greenman's temper ignited like a match to gasoline. In an eruption of fury, he launched into a 30-second rant, the words spewing forth like a torrential storm. His voice echoed throughout the courtroom, his rage directed at the very system that had brought him there. "'The horse, you do everything you want, Greenman of the United States!' he exclaimed, his words laced with defiance and frustration. His contempt for the proceedings was palpable, leaving those present in awe of the magnitude of his outburst. But the court, steadfast and unwavering, wasted no time in responding to Greenman's explosive display. Swiftly, he was ejected from the hallowed halls of justice and into the custody of law enforcement officers. The once captive audience watched as his bond, originally set at $250, was quadrupled to a staggering $1,000. In the end, Greenman's grandiose act of defiance had only sealed his fate further. A mere theft charge had now snowballed into a more severe legal predicament. Yet despite the gravity of the situation, Greenman remained unyielding, determined to have the last word in a courtroom that would not tolerate his volatile outbursts. Number 6. Sean Riker Within the hallowed walls of the Racine County Circuit Court, a tempest of chaos brewed as Sean Riker faced his sentencing. Found guilty of a myriad of crimes, including reckless endangerment and physical attack of a child, Riker arrived in the courtroom fully restrained and cloaked in a spit mask. But even the restraints and the mask could not suppress the turmoil boiling within Riker's soul. His past, marked by detonating pipe explosives and a dozen years in federal prison, 
had seemingly fueled an unquenchable fire of defiance and contempt. As the sentencing proceedings commenced, Riker's demeanor remained defiant, his eyes filled with a dangerous mix of anger and indifference. He paid little attention to the court's attempts to outline the severity of his crimes and the impact they had on his victims. When given the opportunity to speak, Riker seized it as a platform to unleash a storm of vitriol and denial. He denied any wrongdoing, accusing the justice system of conspiring against him. His words reverberated through the courtroom, fueling a sense of unease and disbelief. The judge, resolute in the face of Riker's tirade, delivered a sentence that reflected the gravity of the crimes committed. Life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Those words hung heavy in the air, signaling the end of Riker's reign of terror. As Riker was escorted out of the courtroom, his eyes burning with rage, the weight of his crimes settled upon the proceedings. The victims and their families found solace in the justice that had been served, but the scars left by Riker's actions would forever bear witness to the havoc he had wrought. For Judge Sean Riker, presiding over the sentencing marked a turning point in his career. He had seen the darkest depths of humanity, the depravity that lurked beneath the surface. In the aftermath, Riker vowed to dedicate himself to the pursuit of justice, working tirelessly to prevent such atrocities from befalling innocent lives. In the face of Riker's defiance, the judge remained steadfast, his commitment to justice unwavering. He believed that through his work, he could restore a sense of order and safety to the community he served. Riker's sentencing was a pivotal moment, a reminder of the importance of upholding the principles of justice, even in the face of the most tumultuous storms. Number 5. Timothy DiMatteo In a packed courtroom in Florida, tensions ran high as the case of Timothy DiMatteo unfolded. The atmosphere crackled with anticipation as the rock musician faced charges of petty theft and property damage. As the proceedings commenced, it became evident that DiMatteo was determined to make a spectacle of himself. Dressed in his signature rocker attire, complete with leather jacket and tousled hair, DiMatteo sauntered into the courtroom with an air of defiance. He seemed to relish the attention, flashing a cocky smirk at the onlookers. Little did anyone know that they were about to witness a performance unlike any other. As the judge began questioning DiMatteo, the tension in the room escalated. With an air of exaggerated confidence, DiMatteo launched into a monologue, spewing legal jargon and invoking his constitutional rights. His voice boomed through the courtroom, demanding attention and challenging the authority of the judge. I invoke my first, second, third, fourth, thirteenth, and fourteenth amendment rights. My rights have been violated, DiMatteo bellowed, his voice echoing off the walls. The audience watched in disbelief as DiMatteo transformed the courtroom into his personal stage. It was as if he believed he was headlining a rock concert rather than facing criminal charges. He continued his flamboyant performance, strumming invisible guitar strings and swaying to an imaginary rhythm. Realizing that his antics were not amusing the judge, DiMatteo's expression shifted from defiant to frustrated. The rock star showman had been upstaged, his performance overshadowed by the stern gaze of the judge. Security officers approached, ready to remove the unruly defendant from the courtroom. As they closed in, DiMatteo's resistance crumbled and he allowed himself to be escorted out. The courtroom, which had been filled with chaotic energy moments earlier, gradually returned to a state of order. The judge, resolute in his duty, issued a stern reprimand and maintained the integrity of the legal proceedings. DiMatteo's legal journey had taken an unexpected turn. Though his rock star antics had momentarily captivated the courtroom, they ultimately proved futile. The legal system would not be swayed by theatrics or bravado, justice would prevail, and DiMatteo would have to face the consequences of his actions. Number 4. Sherry Lynn In the sweltering heat of the Florida courtroom, the tension hung heavy in the air as Sherry Lynn, a defendant charged with felony battery and resisting arrest with violence, found herself standing before the judge. Represented by a public defender, Lynn's demeanor seemed to signal an impending storm. The judge, prepared for a challenging encounter, began the proceedings with a seemingly innocuous question, have you ever been treated for any mental health issues? A smoldering anger ignited within Lynn as her face contorted into a scowl. She snapped back at the judge, her voice dripping with contempt, okay, well, I'm a little busy right now. The judge, initially finding amusement in Lynn's brashness, quickly realized the gravity of the situation. 
Attempting to defuse the mounting tension, the judge calmly addressed the defendant, but Lynn's defiance knew no bounds. She dismissed the judge's attempts, unleashing a torrent of anger that reverberated through the courtroom. As the judge attempted to regain control, Lynn's voice rose to a crescendo. She lashed out, accusing the judge of bias, unleashing a storm of words that seemed to fill the space with a tangible fury. Her actions displayed an alarming lack of respect for the authority of the court and a disregard for the consequences of her actions. The judge, now stern and unwavering, asserted his authority. He sternly declared, You ain't got a scream at me. You're gonna raise your voice to me? Oh my God! The judge's words seemed to hang in the air, a line drawn in the sand between the realm of order and the tempestuous world of Lynn. Yet Lynn's anger burned fiercely, unyielding to the judge's rebuke. Disgust etched across her face. She directed her animosity towards the judge, further intensifying the volatile atmosphere. With every insult hurled, Lynn dug herself deeper into the abyss of her own defiance. As the courtroom erupted in chaos, officers swiftly moved in to quell the disturbance. They enveloped Lynn, their presence a stark contrast to her unbridled rage. With firm hands and resolute determination, they escorted her from the courtroom, a symbol of order amid the chaos. Lynn's actions would not go unpunished. The judge, unyielding in the face of such audacious behavior, delivered his ruling. Lynn was ordered to pay a fine of $50 and undergo a full psychiatric evaluation, highlighting the potential underlying mental health concerns that had sparked the fiery exchange in the courtroom. Number 3. Michael Gaines In the dimly lit courtroom, tension hung heavy in the air as the sentencing of Michael Gaines, a man convicted of battery against a police officer, unfolded. The judge's voice pierced through the silence, stern and unwavering, as he addressed the defendant about his reckless actions. Gaines sat slouched in his chair, his eyes darting around the room with a hint of defiance. His demeanor was an unsettling blend of simmering anger and contempt, as if he harbored a storm within, ready to unleash its fury at any moment. The judge's words, laced with authority and disapproval, seek to provoke Gaines further. His voice grew louder, his face contorting with a mixture of frustration and indignation. He vehemently denied any wrongdoing, his words dripping with bitterness and accusation. I didn't hop up, no saliva, Gaines shouted, his voice laced with defiance. His outburst reverberated through the courtroom, sending ripples of unease among those present. But the judge, undeterred, stood his ground, determined to maintain order in his courtroom. You're gonna believe lies because they're wearing a uniform? Gaines spat, his voice seething with resentment. His words cut through the air like shards of glass, their impact palpable. The judge, his patient waning, attempted to restore calm, his voice steady but firm. You ain't gotta scream at me, he said, his tone tinged with exasperation. You're gonna raise your voice to me? But Gaines, consumed by a wellspring of anger, refused to back down. His voice rose to match the judges, his rage boiling over. The courtroom became a battlefield of voices, a clash of wills between an unyielding judge and a defiant defendant. In the midst of the chaos, the judge's authority prevailed. He delivered his final verdict, his words piercing through Gaines' resistance. Thirteen years. All the evidence shows that you deliberately... Yeah, okay. Gaines yeah, words. yeah, yeah. I appreciate Mr. Gaines making my point for <laughs> You punk. Very well received. Maggot mother. I know the you words did. were that you deliberately were hawking up. Bullshit. I didn't hawk up no saliva. You gonna raise your voice at me? Oh my god. You raise your voice to me. I raise my voice to you. You. That's bullshit. And you gonna believe those lies? That's what I'm talking about. And I don't. I don't think I have to take insults from you. I know. Words. You. You. Uh, Use a. I didn't hawk up no saliva. You gonna believe a lie? Cause they wearing uniform. Use a a a guy now. Use you, a but I think you'll be a 13 years that would shape the course of his life. Yet Gaines, caught in the grips of his own anger, could not accept defeat gracefully. His eyes burned with indignation, his face twisted in a mask of disdain. Disgusted by the sentence, he lashed out, his actions bordering on madness. With an explosion of fury, Gaines invoked his inner strength summoning a surge of power to manifest in his physical form. He kicked down the courtroom door, shattering the boundaries that confined him, but his rebellion didn't end there. 
As chaos erupted, chairs were flung through the air, propelled by a man consumed by rage. The officers, valiant in their duty, flooded the courtroom, swiftly subduing Gaines, their determination unwavering. Gaines, a vessel of unrelenting defiance, was forcibly removed from the courtroom, the weight of his actions pressing heavily upon him. The additional eight months handed down as punishment seemed minuscule compared to the turmoil raging within his soul. Ready to go, I was ready to I'm go. Talking. I, I, you, I'm talking I'm talking to you. Take out of the courtroom. February 15th, that rogue-ass Diaz beat the man, fractured his jaw. Yeah, you're a tough guy. He's a maggot, punk. You should have died when you was a baby. Yeah. Maggot. Put him in the hospital on life support. You remember that? So he, they doing, he's doing such a good job, isn't he? Diaz. Anytime, Mr. Gaines. Shut up, punk. He's a maggot. You should have died when you was a baby. Still born. Wearing a uniform, right? Rogue hey, deputy. Look at me. Just I'm like eager. You ain't got to scream at me. Number two, Jesse Rose. In an Australian courtroom, tension hung heavy in the air as the judge delivered the verdict to 25-year-old Jesse Rose. The former aspiring rugby player had been charged with reckless wounding, an attack after drunkenly hurling a glass at a security guard in a pub. As his attorney pleaded for leniency, Rose's hopes for a lighter sentence were dashed. Fueled by disappointment and disgust, Rose's demeanor shifted. With a seething resentment burning within him, he snapped. Ignoring all restraint, he invoked his inner athlete, channeling his rugby-playing days. In an explosive display of anger, he delivered a swift kick, shattering the courtroom door. Chaos ensued as he unleashed his fury, launching not one, but two chairs at the officers. As the commotion escalated, additional officers flooded the courtroom, determined to regain control. Subduing Rose, they escorted him out, leaving behind a scene of shattered expectations and broken decorum. The judge, unswayed by the display, tacked an additional eight months onto Rose's original 14-month sentence, a stern reminder that violent outbursts carry consequences even for those once considered promising athletes. Number 1. Michael Hugenberg Within the Campbell County Court in Newport, Kentucky, the case of Michael Hugenberg unfolded. Facing charges of attacking a Campbell County deputy and standing trial for weapons-related offenses, Hugenberg anxiously awaited the magistrate's decision on his pretrial release. However, as the magistrate contemplated the matter, Hugenberg's patience waned. Realizing that his fate was about to be sealed within the confines of a jail cell, You've been in a lot of court cases. You've been before a lot of judges. Your thoughts on saying that? Well, inmate whacking a sheriff's deputy in the head during a court appearance. Yelling that you people are under arrest. I don't know what he's talking about. Jurors, he's talking about deputy uh, sheriffs. Causing absolute chaos right there. Now, let's show you the man at the center of the incident. Here he is. Now, here, come your back. You are under arrest. These people are under arrest. Here at the Campbell County Courthouse on Monday after a man who was about to go on trial decided to disrupt the proceedings. These people are under arrest. He was sitting there ready for trial. He wasn't handcuffed. He wasn't shackled. The deputies are trying to keep him from approaching the jurors. And he's struggling with them. Shackle people while they're in trial. You cannot tell me what to do. I am not a prisoner. Just out of them. You are under. It's pretty unusual. Uh, this guy is, uh, you know, somebody just keeps digging his hole deeper and deeper. He seized control of the situation. In a daring act of defiance, Hugenberg lunged forward, attempting to make an audacious escape right there in the courtroom. But the officers stationed in the courtroom were quick to react. They swiftly overwhelmed Hugenberg, bringing him crashing to the ground. The once hopeful defendant was forcibly removed from the courtroom, his dreams of freedom shattered. Eventually, Hugenberg pleaded guilty to his attempted escape and the reckless harm he caused to an emergency worker. His fate was sealed with the realization that his impulsive actions had only exacerbated his legal troubles. Now, Condemned to face the consequences of his actions, Hugenberg found himself confined to a future behind bars. The courtroom, once a symbol of hope for justice, had become a stark reminder of the choices he had made and the path he had willingly walked. That's all for this video, folks. We'll see you next time.